Um, thank you for joining us. This morning, uh, I'm going to be talking with Leo Marmel. And uh, Leo is the managing partner of the architectural firm Marmel Radziner. Uh, they were founded in 1989. And they have over 200 employees in their offices in Santa Monica, New York, and San Francisco. Um, Leo, um, today we're going to be talking about, Leo is well, well known for his architecture, but we're going to delve into another area of Leo's talents um, and his current passion, which is painting. So Leo's going to be joining us in a moment. Um, Probably the biggest influences on his career as an architect have been um, the noted architects like Schindler, Neutra, and Lautner. And um, one of the things that I, I love about Leo and the Marmel Radziner, Radziner um, here I think they are just joining us, here we go. Great. There you are. Hi. Hi, Leo. How are you? Hey, Mark. Very well. Thank you. Thank you for joining. So I was just giving them a little background on um, your firm and uh, just beginning to talk about the influences um, the, uh, on your uh, career as an architect, such as Neutra, Schindler, and Lautner. And... Um, I know that, you know, one of the things I've always loved about your work is that um, your buildings integrate architecture and community and architecture and nature. And I know I approach design very much the same way. So um, can you tell me a little bit about how and why you like to integrate homes with their surroundings and why they should be enhance the community rather than ignore, you know, the scale and character of a neighborhood. Sure. And first of all, thank you, Mark, for inviting me. And I'm really excited to be here. I, I think more than anything, we're modernists at heart. And modernism at its core is about connection. Connection to nature, connection to each other, it's about simplification and reducing things down to a core idea focus and connect better. So I think more than anything, our work and our history is, is about that spirit of connection. Um, and how do you, how do you connect um, the architecture to the exterior? By opening up as much as possible, using glass to the greatest extent, extent possible, by having doors and walls that can disappear so that we can physically participate. And, and I think part of what we miss about being in nature is the connection to the rhythms of the planet and the way the sun moves and the way the wind goes across our sights. And so... Um, more than anything, we're just trying to get people, encourage people to live outside as much as possible. Yeah, and I think that's a very important thing, especially for today, where um, nature is very healing and we all, we all need this so desperately. Um, you know, I remember um, one of my earlier projects, I know a, I had a client in the 70s, they purchased the, um, the famous Neutra Kaufman House in Palm Springs. And we did some work on that project. And my client, unfortunately, didn't own it that long. And uh, I've always loved that residence. And I just recently found out that um, your firm and uh, you were hired to restore that house. And I know I drove by it several years ago and I drove by and thought, wow, this is incredible. Whoever did this restoration was extraordinary and it turned out to be you. So what was it like working on that? It's probably Neutra's most famous house. Uh, he, what's so interesting about it is that we did that work in the late 1990s. In fact, uh -huh. we restoration in 1998. And yet, 
even today, people continue to reference the house. And I think that speaks to the power of Neutra's work. That happens in the landscape. It's cited so brilliantly and sensitively um, to allow your vista to just be endlessly carried out in the 1940s was an endless desert vista. Now, of course, we have neighbors and we had to screen those neighbors, but the original conception of the house just so brilliantly allowed your view to be extended out into the landscape. Yeah. So uh, most people are familiar with your work as an architect, obviously, um, but I don't think they're um, familiar with your work as an artist. And this is, this is your newest passion, is painting. So I thought it would be a lot of fun today to talk about your painting, because after reading a little bit about you and your work as, a, as an artist, I was really fascinated. So um, I want to change direction and talk about your painting. So, and with your permission, I'd like to read um, um, a little paragraph from the foreword of the book from your first exhibition. Um, the question you were asked is, what came first, your interest in painting or designing buildings? And you said, my interest in art emerges while I was studying architecture. I was also studying philosophy and was particularly interested in the existential thinkers and the study of aesthetics. All these subjects swirled together in my head during school. Painting was a refuge. I often felt overwhelmed with the turbulence of feeling unprepared and alien. I discovered painting to be a playful way to explore all the emotions that I couldn't easily give words to. That's a, that's a remarkable paragraph with a lot of emotion and a lot of insight in it. So um, when, did you, when did you first develop a passion for painting? Well, as you read, I began painting in college, and it was just a fun way to explore ideas, but more than anything, um, have this personal time to meditate, in a sense. It, it is my meditation. It is my focus away from the world, which is why no one knew about it. I didn't paint for others. I painted for myself. It was always a very private enterprise. Uh, today, people are very surprised by it. And in a sense, I made paintings and the fact that I do this available to others last year when I did my first show at The Landing. And Gerard O'Brien, who runs The Landing, was incredibly encouraging and supportive to allow me to kind of come out of the closet, the painter, and say... Um, yes, I have this other world, and it's always been my um, my refuge uh, to deal with the tensions and challenges of the world. So for me, it's it's a joyous expression. Um, it's still a very modern exploration of color and emotion, uh, but but it was something I did for myself. So it's new for me just to talk about it. And for me to share about it, it's, I'm not new to painting, I'm just new to talking about it. So to this day, it still feels a little awkward and uncomfortable to talk about painting. I'm much more experienced talking about architecture and much more comfortable because it is such a public sport. Architecture is out there on the landscape for everyone to see and participate with, which I love. So it's a little harder for me to talk about and share paintings only because... Um, it's so personal. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, and in that vein, I know um, uh, your father was a Presbyterian minister and, and passed away several years ago. And um, you had said he left you his Bible and you weren't sure exactly what to do with it or how to make peace with his memory. And as a Gemini and an atheist, you often feel you live in two distinct worlds, American and Cuban, God and no God, architect and painter. And is this what led you to, uh, to abstraction? 
Well, I will say your research is impressive. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is. Abstraction is about emotions. It's about movement. It's about uh, a creative human force. And yes, I love realism and I respect it. But for me, as this refuge, it is more about dance and emotion than it is about representation. So, the abstraction is this kind of free celebration of color and freedom. Um, and, and interesting, with my father's passing, um, again, I, I turned to painting and I, I got this Bible and I immediately started kind of taking it apart, um, which I think he would have been okay with, and integrating it into paintings as a collage. And um, you can see on my Instagram page a, a couple of paintings that use those bits and pieces of the Bible as a way um, to represent and really honor him, but at the same time swirl color and emotion behind that. Right. So you're, you um, are, have a Cuban heritage. So, and, and I know that in the first show, your first collection of paintings were greatly inspired by uh, strong Cuban colors, the colors of the Cuban flag. Can we talk a little bit about um, how that, how you express that into your paintings? Sure. My parents came to the U.S. not to be Americans, uh -huh. but for my father to go to school. Their intention was for them to come, study, and go back. While they were here... Castro took over in 1959. So they right. day at that point. And so um, at the time when I was a kid, assimilation meant becoming just like everyone else. So we became as white as possible. Uh, we were living in Marin County. And, and so my Cuban heritage, again, was something behind the scenes and not brought forward. And so I lived in this kind of often confusing um, climate of trying to be very American, yet at the same time having this um, culture that was now seen at the time as threatening, as communist, as evil, as um, something uncomfortable to say you're a part of. And so maybe it is true as a Gemini I, I always had this kind of dual sensibility, this sense that um, I am American and proud to be so and, and want to understand what that means, while at the same time honoring my culture, which is Latin and, and emotional and Cuban and, and all the joy and struggles that come with that heritage. That is the American spirit. We are all immigrants. We are mm -hmm. all in some way assimilating and that that was the spirit of my first show and how did you select those colors was it um i read in a few of the paintings you selected them from the um cuban flag but you're very drawn to um um saturated very strong colors no question color for me is emotion and right as a Cuban, emotion is always so much a part of our spirit. We can't drop. Right. Yes. Yeah. We tend to be very gestural and emotive. Um, and, and there's a great joy and love and spirit in all of that. And so color for me represents that. And there were a couple of pieces um, that we looked at and studied for the show and used those as a springboard to kind of explore this notion of assimilation, of dual uh, Americanism, where you're American and from someplace else at the same time, and what does that mean, especially in today's context, uh, political context, that is. And so um, the color of the Cuban flag became a, a, a consistent theme. Now that was worked a couple of years ago. I think today in the world of COVID, the work is quieter and less about those kind of turgid emotions. And uh -huh. I turn to a, a, a calmer, quieter, um, more introspective moment of painting. Um, right. So there are many kind of different times. 
So in, in your first work, or when I first saw your work, I, I, was, I saw references perhaps to Rothko and Motherwell and perhaps a bit of Helen Frankenthaler. Sure. I mean, they're gods to me because even when they spoke about their work, they, they wanted to talk about the emotional context and, and what those colors meant to them and how they felt about them. And so um, I never get bored looking at a Rothko painting because each time I approach it, I'm in a different place. The painting gives me something else. And I can't tell you how many hours I've spent seated in front of the moments you get original uh, opportunities to sit in front of an original piece at a museum and, and just to feel that exchange. And again, it's a collaboration, very much right. uh -huh. um, and, and you participate in this dialogue between the painting and yourself and the context that you bring to that moment, the context the painting brings. I just think it's so wonderfully human. You know, you have that moment to feel um, your, yourself in, in the space. And, and I, I just, for me, um, those are wonderful moments. No, I think that's how uh, most people view art. I mean, it's, it's so important. You'll see something and it evokes emotion. could be beauty, it could be anger, it could be angst, whatever it is. And um, because the, the piece is speaking to you, um, I know that you love texture. And uh, you talked about texture and carving into um, paint and that it leaves a trace of moment. But it's also a peek at what's behind and very much like a person as they age, becoming more beautiful and more interesting with age. I thought that was a beautiful comment. Yeah, um, I, I'm not sure I'm becoming more beautiful with age, but uh, <laughs> certainly there are more layers to peel back um, as we age. Uh, but in a painting, I very much, um, feel this notion of texture and this kind of layering process. And, and if you look at the paintings, often there's a, there's kind of a, a, a thickness to them. There's the opportunity to paint behind and then to paint over and to allow the paint to become thicker and, and hint and cover what's behind and therefore hide, but open up a little peak at what's behind the image. And so I, I, I just love that kind of playfulness. Um, I, I love that uh, for me, um, it kind of uh, allows a history to be shown. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, the, and, and this is a, a current piece. So again, it's simpler and quieter than some of the work I've done in the past, which I think is more kind of Urgent and, and emotional, but some of the I mean, if you look at like um, these kind of colors and textures, um, you again get the hint of what's behind, and I'm starting to build texture forward. This is a work in progress, so it's not done, um, but you can start to feel that depth, and and that's fundamentally also architectural. This notion of movement and depth within the canvas, um, and then color as adding this emotional layer. Uh, this is a very early piece. Can, um, Leo, would you ask um, Anne if she could um, step back and take a, a view of the blue painting again? I think it's really stunning. I'll get out of the way. <laughs> so tell, tell us a little bit about your what the emotions um, 
evoke in this painting? What did, what were you thinking while you were painting this? Well, I, I will say this particular one, I think, has probably more of an architectural kind of thought in that the background, the, the base paint is that kind of bright, aggressive, kind of obnoxious turquoise blue. Um, and then covering that and trying to minimize that because it's way too uncomfortable with just a quieter, gentler, more peaceful notion, purple um, and deeper blues, which, you know, blue is such a color of depth and peace and solitude for me. Red is, for me, a very turgid, angry, emotional feeling. And look, those are historically consistent, but we all respond to color. Mm -hmm. It's just for me, I think here, it's kind of looking at a, a more peaceful way to cover what for me was a very violent blue and a very aggressive, obnoxious blue, wanting to settle that with a deeper purple um, and darker color um, about that. Beautiful. Thank you. So in, the, in this painting with the four squares and the, the red? Yeah, this one's early. Um, this is right at the beginning. Um, so there's the underpaint of orange and then the deeper purple on that. Um, and, and again, having a strong kind of geometric um, structure to it. Uh, and then I'm starting to layer on colors on top of that structure. Eventually, I'm sure as I work the piece, um, it, it will get more complex visually and I'll lay more color over it. Um, these pieces tend to be over longer periods of time, much more built up. Um, where that piece we were looking at earlier, the green and orange piece, and, and also these pieces over in this, th these are much more immediate. These are faster pieces where there's a base color. Uh -huh. Secondary color is applied in one um, in, in one sitting, so to speak, in one application, uh, and there's no turning back. You just have to have the the willingness to take a chance and apply color. And so these are done as one kind of movements, similar to this over here too. These two paintings are also done um, at one time, so they're faster. They're, they're less visually complex. So I, I'm just finding myself painting in this way right now, just a little simpler, a um, little more immediate, um, less uh, building over time. Like that blue piece, that's going to build over time. That'll be a much longer um, kind of uh, period of work. And, and keep in mind, I paint in my free time. I paint part-time. I'm not a a real painter in the sense that this is how I... Well, you also have a very dynamic career as an architect. So, I mean, but this is such a treat to be in the studio and to see your work and see the progression of these works. I think it's exciting. Um, so when you think about painting something new, what is your inspiration? Is it color? Is it shape? Is it an object? What? How do you, you know, what, what is your inspiration for starting something new? Um, you know, uh, I think of painting as play. <laughs> and when I have the moment, and I have a little bit of time, um, just like a kid, you want the opportunity to not worry too much about what you're doing. It's just, you, you just start exploring. Um, there's no question, there are some paintings, and you'll see them on my Instagram page, where there's a clear idea that I'm expressing, the Cuban flag paintings, mm -hmm. painting of Fidel Castro and his brother Raul, you, you know, there's a clear idea that I come to the cam canvas with and I um, work through that. But other paintings like these, they're just kind of um, inspirations of the moment. I, I, there may be a color I walk into the studio with. Um, I love, I, I will say, I'm new to Instagram. Because, again, I, I used it for the first time to show paintings. Um, I, I have nothing outside of paintings on my personal social media. It's that one thing. Um, and I'm loving the opportunity to see painters from literally all over the world 
And I will sometimes just browse Instagram and, and there'll be something that triggers a thought and, and I'll think, oh man, I, I need to play with that. And I'll walk into the studio with those colors or those shapes and I will start developing work based on that. Um, sometimes um, it's just having a great day or having a really terrible day. Um, walking <laughs> the sense of anger, the sense of frustration, the sense of disappointment, and I'll play with that. Um, and so there's a wide variety of, of paintings uh, because every day I walk into the studio with a different um, perspective. Uh, and again, because for me it's part-time, um, right. it's just these moments where I got, get to play and um, explore through play. So have you found that your, your um, taste in art um, or the way you view art has changed um, greatly over a period of years as you've um, become more involved in painting? I will say one thing that has changed for me in the world of art is my respect for artists. Um, is I, I'm sorry, but I didn't hear that. My respect for uh -huh. art. Yes. Um, because, you know, we focus so much of our energy and our politic and our, our time on other things. Art, for me, and when I view it, is that moment where I can start to focus. And, and art forces us to frame an idea or an emotion or a moment and, and, and concentrate on that. The artist allows me the opportunity to look at things that I may never want to look at or allow myself to look at, and they will confront me um, with that view, and I'm going to have to deal with it in some way. And so artists open up for me ideas and thoughts and emotions that I would never have had otherwise. Right. Uh, I, I do. I love going to museums. I am so sad that that's been restricted. Um, I am so desperate to go to a museum. Right. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I, I think more than anything, it's just my uh, enthusiasm for artists and my support and love for what they do. Um, is has grown immensely. Yeah, I, I think so many people will, you know, they'll see paintings, they'll be at a museum, a gallery, whatever, and they'll view things and, oh, I could paint that, or this is simple. And um, there's so much, like you say, there's so much emotion and passion and thought that goes into something, even something that might be very simple. And it's always great to have the insight of the artist so you know what's what this particular piece of art is is saying to you and um and without that knowledge i think you're missing the whole point of of viewing um a piece of art well so. I, I also whenever i hear that statement you know i could paint that my response is absolutely you could go right. Go make something. <laughs> there really is no greater joy. And to use that as a criticism makes no sense to me. It should be an acknowledgement that you too are an artist. We are all capable of making things. It's not about calling yourself an artist and, and having some big idea. It's not about that. It's an acceptance of your humanity, and that is a creative force. Mm -hmm. And that are all capable of painting. I'm not a trained painter. I've just given myself the space to play in that area. I think we can all find a space. It doesn't have to be painting, it could be something else. But to use that as a way to um, not only work through emotions and, and challenges, but it's just a free, loving way to to make things for yourself, put them in your own house, um, and celebrate your creative power. We're all painters. And, you know, that it's, it's really much the same as architecture, too. Um, you know, living with um, wonderful architecture, great art, 
great interiors. It's all the same. It, you know, it's, it enriches your life. And it's also um, sort of an, a window into um, your mind and your soul. And, and, you know, that's the essence of being a human being. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. For me, architecture is fundamentally different than this stuff. Architecture is a team sport. Architecture is a collaborative enterprise. When I paint, mm -hmm. I don't have to think about what anyone's going to think of, of the painting. This is right. It's very selfish. It's a moment when I can <laughs> only focus, I only need to focus on myself. Architecture it's the opposite of that. There's so many forces pushing and pulling on you. And I, I've had the real joy and opportunity to surround myself with incredible creative genius from my business partner, Ron Radziner, who is such an inspiration to me every day and his kind of creative genius. Um, but also all the people that work with us in our studio. Um, there's just this... this frenzy of ideas and perspectives um, but somehow that has to be focused and coalesced into a building and, and that's a complicated difficult thing right yeah all those ideas and perspectives into one expression is is hard this to me is is for me easy because I don't have to care about what you think <laughs> I, which is, you don't have cli some client or, or designer telling you we need to make this larger or this space doesn't work <laughs> or it's too expensive right, um, right. <laughs> and, and all of that in architecture I think is really positive because things get better from those perspectives um, where my paintings I, I'm, maybe they'd get better if people were directing me and having those comments as I did it, but it would lose the joy for me because this is mine. Yeah, it, it would dilute your work. I know um, last week um, I was speaking with my friend Saban Howard, and he is doing the World War One Memorial in Washington. And you know, he said that it was very difficult for him because he was dealing with government um, and government committees. And everybody had to throw in their 10 cents. And, of course, he said um, the work would have been a disaster. It would have been diluted down to nothing. Had he, and he had to stick to his conviction. So that, and, and I guess that's the great thing about um, painting or sculpting is that um, it, is, it is about how you feel and how you are seeing this particular moment. Sure. I, I, and, and there are artists that make it an architectural endeavor in this mm -hmm. of the enterprise, which immediately starts bringing in political complexities and economic complexities. And the beauty of the artwork um, is in that, that um, kind of architectural process of bringing all that together and still ending up with pure poetry. Um, and, and that's the challenge. Um, so, here it's in the studio. It's just easier for me. Um, it's your inner sanctum. So, where do you think your new work uh, is going to take you? Oh, that's interesting. I, I don't exactly know, um, but I, I will say, in some ways, it's getting simpler right now. Um, a little more modern, maybe. Um, a little less um, turgid and active, um, and most of the work is is a bit quieter. Uh, but at the same time, like that blue piece, that's still in the studio, too. Um, so maybe I, I will just keep exploring those ideas of solitude and quiet um, using single colors. I mean, there's this, um, I'm really excited about exploring this idea, which is single color. Um, and just looking at texture and form and eliminating the the struggle of bringing two colors together. So right. this is a piece and an area I want to explore much more so. Um, and I'm really excited and bought a bunch more board to, um, to kind of study single 
color expression. So, so maybe it'll it'll continue to be this um, Gemini-like um, struggle between the simple single colors and this kind of more um, confused, uh, excited um, world of movement and texture. And, and somehow those two will never really resolve themselves. Oh, Leo, this is, it's such a treat to um, be in your studio with you and um, visit with you. I could talk about this for hours. And I, I definitely want to visit you because I'm, I, I love your work. Um, what is the best way for people? Is it the Instagram? <laughs> Excuse me. Your Instagram account, the best way for people to um, find you and your paintings? Well, right now, the Instagram account is the only place to find me. Okay. Thing. Leonardo E. Marmol is my Instagram account. The architectural work um, is on the marmol radziner.com website. Yes. That's easily found um, uh, on the internet. And, and so um, okay. the painting side is, is on Instagram. And do you have any plans for um, an upcoming exhibition? I have. I've been working on two exhibitions. I've been invited to do two exhibitions, which we were working on, and then COVID hit. Um, oh. Two exhibitions have been put on hold. One will be in the desert, and one will be in the Central Coast, uh, where Ron and I went to school near San Luis Obispo. Um, so two, in my mind, different shows, one small on the Central Coast and one a little larger. But um, I hope someday those can get rescheduled and we can, we can do them. Well, well we're going to look forward to, um, I'm, I'm going to look forward to seeing those shows. Um, anyway, Leo, this has really been a treat. Thank you so much for taking the time away from architecture and um, painting and showing us this sort of intimate time with you in the studio it's great thanks thank so much you. thank you i've really enjoyed this thanks all right thanks bye-bye so um